Once again, happy Father's Day. Glad you're all here with us today. Okay.
I thank you so much this morning for everybody that's here and watching. Lord, here's an opportunity for us to come into your presence and, and Lord, sit at your feet and, and Lord, have you teach us. I thank you for all the dads who are here. I thank you for all the men who have mentored younger men and younger kids and who still do that. Lord, direct us through your word to be better men, to, Lord, find our balance uh, within this fatherhood that we find ourselves in. I pray that, uh, that everyone here would encourage one another as we try to bring on a, a generation that turns back to you instead of away. So right now, Lord, bless your people, bless our hearts. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, before the kids go downstairs, I want them to hang out for a couple minutes, okay, if you don't mind. I'm going to bust the kids loose, but I, I, I think what I'm going to share with you this morning, uh, my grandkids really like riddles and jokes, and so I have some riddles and jokes for you to uh, begin the, the message. So I want the kids to hear these, and uh, I begin with this. Did you know that French fries were not cooked in France? They were cooked in Greece. <laughs> oh, they get worse, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> so the kid runs up to his dad and says, Dad, are you all right? Dad says, nope, I'm half left. They're, I'm telling you, they're bad. How about the kid? You guys like this? Julian, you like these jokes so far? Uh, see, he's nodding his head, yes, okay. All right, so here's number three. Kid comes to his dad and says, I'm hungry. What's his dad say? Hello, hungry, I'm dad. Oh, that's bad. I know, they're bad. You know, you know Chuck, yesterday I ate a clock. It was very time consuming. Especially when I went back for seconds. Ah! That's good. These are good. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Did you spill your water there when you heard that one? Oh, that's good. Okay. So, so did, you hear, did you hear about the guy that invented lifesavers? They said he meant a mint. He made a mint. A, okay. Uh, how about, uh, what's that? These are for the kids. I don't know why I'm telling you this. All right, here's another one. Boy, they're starting to heckle in the back. I hate that. <laughs> Well, wait, wait till they start tuning out here. That's good. Okay, wait. It's a good one. Uh, a ham sandwich walks into a bar and orders a beer. Bartender says, sorry, we don't serve food here. Ah! <laughs> There's another good one. Okay. I got, I got four more. Just dang it. Oh, I know. I know. We don't, have any, uh, we don't have any vomit bags or anything in here. These are pretty bad. Here we go. Here's number seven. I used to work at, a, I used to have a job at a calendar factory, but I got fired. I took a couple days off. <laughs> These are knee slappers, aren't they? I, I kill me, man, I do, watch. Okay, so, so, so two guys, two guys walk into a bar, and the third guy ducks. Walk into a bar. Boy, nobody got that one, man, not even you, Chuck, I'll tell you. Oh, I know. Okay, I got two more. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what happens when an artist has trouble finding inspiration? Oh, that wasn't it. He, he draws a blank. Ah! I've been there. All right, one more, one more, one more. Okay, here we go. Um, I was, <laughs> was going to tell you a time-traveling joke but you didn't get it. <laughs> is, is that good? Like, oh, okay, kids, you can go ahead and go downstairs. I'll cut you loose. What's that? You were, you were teaching a boring lesson. Okay, now they'll be talking about, especially uh, the one about the, uh, the, the one, I don't know which one they're going to talk about. Lifesavers, probably. Kids, you can go ahead down with uh, Miss Shannon there. And, uh, okay, she's going. I'm sorry? Terry, Terry is a very lucky lady. I hope you said that loud enough that she heard you. And everybody else. 
she went, mm. oh, uh, buffalo, who's? buffalo wings taste like chicken. Buffalo wings taste like chicken. That's another good one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wh- when, when is a door not a door? When it's a jar. That's right. Okay. All right. That's enough. <laughs> Oh, these are, these are awful. These are just bad. Okay, happy Father's Day, by the way. All right, so the message this morning is entitled Fatherhood, um, a question of balance. I don't know about you guys. I, I don't know. But I know that uh, the, the longer I'm a dad and a grandfather, and uh, boy, that sounds old. I'd rather say papa. As long as I've been a papa, it's, it's hard. It's, there's a balance there. Because I got to go against my own grain and, and look more like Christ, okay? So it, it's basically a tightrope ride. That's what it is. It's, it refers to the really precarious responsibilities we have as daddies and, uh, and, and papas. Uh, now, now, scriptures are full of instructions. By the way, all the jokes are done now, so I, you don't have to sit there and wait for another one to show up and you rear its ugly head. Listen, would you, uh, would you draw your swords? Would you hold your swords up? Let's get them up. Hold them up high. Very good. Now repeat after me, Deuteronomy 12. Okay, very good. Charge. Okay. Um, you know, these instructions that God gives to us in raising kids, uh, supporting the, here's the balance, see? It's, it's raising your kids, it's supporting your family, it's being a, lovely, uh, a loving husband, uh, it's being socially conscious, obviously, uh, in helping others, and changing poopy diapers, and well, maybe not the last one. It doesn't take balance there. There's a lot of responsibilities that dads have, and I get it. One of the responsibilities that John the Baptist uh, was sent to give us was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the kids, to their children. We're going to look at a number of different passages of Scripture, but that Deuteronomy 12 is what I'm going to close with, so you can look them up, uh, look that one up. You know, if ever there was a time for the hearts of men to be turned to their children, it's right now. You see the state of our country right now. You see the state of the, the condition of society. And I really believe that we have dropped the ball. Uh, I worked with teenagers for 37 years. And over that 37 years, I've seen a lot of evidence to support the fact that the reason the world and the reason this nation and the reason our families and the reason the church is in the condition that it is is because of fathers. I really believe that. And and I am one. So I'm not pointing the finger at anybody besides me. Dads who don't have their hearts turned to their kids. I want to talk about balance here. We're going to be talking about it. Dads who never put their arm around their kid and told them they love them. I don't know what kind of father you had. If you even... uh, I know you had a biological one. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you had a great father. Maybe you had a father that was perfect. I did not. My dad was imperfect, but man, I miss him and I love him. You know, dads who have never taken their kids to church or, or sent them to Sunday school or youth meetings or activities, and more importantly, that don't go with them. They're out of balance. See? Dads who've walked out on the family and who have time for everything in the world but never have time for their kiddos. Dads who have never led their kids in prayer, never prayed with them or prayed for them because they don't understand the concept of relationship with Christ. They don't understand why we need to pray for wisdom as we're fathers. You know, the father commanded a very high position in the family back in the Old Testament. His word was law, okay? Maybe, maybe your house was like that. His word was law. The Hebrew word translated into English as husband actually means Lord. Husband, now Lord or master, excuse me, owner 
or possessor, and those are from Genesis 18, 12, and Hosea, <coughs> excuse me, Hosea 2, 16. You know, because of his position, dad had to share to some degree that, that authority with his wife. A man expected to be treated as royalty. Do you guys, anybody want to be treated like royalty here, any of you guys? Nobody raised their hand. I'm surprised. Sarah does. She wants to. Okay. <laughs> but that, I find that interesting. Nobody raised their hand. Oh, I'd like to be treated like royalty. You know, I'm not, <laughs> but I'd like to be. You got to earn that respect. <coughs> Excuse me. Did I just cough into my microphone? I'm sorry if I did that. You know, respect of the rest of the family. I'll get moving here in a minute. We're still working on this. The fifth commandment carries the idea. You know, what's the fifth commandment? Somebody tell me. Honor your father and mother, right? Okay. So there's an importance in the parents. One step further when it states, you know, honor your father and your mother. That's Exodus 20, verse 12. The word honor often refers to to our response to God. There's a leader. We have a leader, okay? Want to talk balance? Uh, in the Old Testament, Dad was not just the king of the castle. Uh, and if you think that might be your only responsibility, you're wrong. Balance was challenging for them and for us. In these three areas, I'm going to give you three areas right here. Spiritually, uh, socially, and economically, we're going to look at some scripture that will tie into all these things. I'm talking about balance. We might have strengths in one or maybe even two of those areas, those arenas. But God is telling us, listen, I want you to have balance in all three. And that can be tough. Let's talk about spiritually first, okay? Spiritually speaking, the dad was to be the spiritual leader of the family, you want to talk balance? Ask yourself that question. Are you the spiritual leader of your family? The earth blesser, the, the Satan bruiser, you were the one. You were the one that led your children and generations after them in your walk with God. Dad functioned actually as the priest of the family. If you go back to Genesis, but I'll take you to Job. Job 1.5 says this, watch this. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. That's his kids. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. He sacrificed for his kids. He made sure that they were right with God. Now, there were, the, the priesthood came along then afterwards. And so his, the, the father's responsibilities changed a little bit somewhat uh, from the spiritual. Sacrifice, when we think of the word sacrifice, we don't go out and and kill an ox in order to sacrifice for our kids. We do a lot of different kinds of things to sacrifice for our kids. Monetarily, um, we try to lead them, right? There's got to be balance there. Yeah, I don't know about you guys. It's tough being a dad. It's tough being able to balance the responsibilities of your job and the responsibilities of your, of your family and, and the responsibilities you have to rest and, and try to rejuvenate. I mean, that's a tightrope sometimes. Sacrifices redefined. The training of children, this is the thing, the training of the children has not been redefined. We still need to train them towards godliness. Watch. Proverbs 22, 6, you've heard me speak this before. You've heard me share it before on maybe devos or something like that. But Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, train, that word, is key. 
I won't bore you with my regular explanation of that, but I need to tell you it's something that follows along behind. And, and this is the problem that we have in a lot of cases, where fathers do not train their kids to come to Christ. We will train them in a lot of different things. I have to congratulate dads who have trained their kids uh, how, to, how to throw a curveball or how to play baseball or how to roll cast a fly. These are important things. They're great things to pass down to your kids, right? We, we like to do that. That's really good stuff. And it builds our relationship with them. Making sure the kids have enough sleep, that kind of stuff. We want to train them. They need to follow along behind us. But with that command to train, I'm troubled because sometimes we fail with that. Dads will fail in making sure their kids, listen, uh, and I've shared this before. Listen, kids are busy, man. You want them, if you're like me, you want your kids to glean and to squeeze as much enjoyment and as much passion out of life as you possibly can. Because that's what dads do. But the problem with that is that when we're filling their time with all these activities and stuff, we fail to, to guide them, train them spiritually. God wants us. Do you, do you make sure your kids get into the Bible every day? Do you have a family devotional? These are all ways that you can change the influence of the world on your kids. Because right now, the more they are in the world, the more the world is in them. You get that? So the point I'm trying to make here with this spiritual is you need to pour Christ into them. And you can't do that if you're not in Christ yourself. We can have all these, de- listen, I got passions all over the place. But the problem is when they become priorities over my relationship with Christ, God says we got a problem. And this is a problem that we pass on by our example to our kids. We don't put a priority on God enough. We don't put a priority on kids enough. I'm embarrassed that that women take on more of a role of leading their sons than men do in a lot of cases. Okay? Do you lead them? Do you take your kids to church? Have you led them here? Do you bring them here? Do you prioritize Jesus' influence on them? Because that's a big deal. That's the priority right there. God has commanded us to train them spiritually to follow him, to know Christ, to love him. And, and, and listen, we know, we know enough that we will say, listen, you need to go to church. Man, I talk to people all the time. Hey, I send my kids to church. I don't take them, I send them. You need to lead them. That's our job, right? Okay, so let's move on to socially. Our job as fathers, is to take advantage of the opportunities we have to train them, not just in the things of this life, but also in Christ. Socially, here's the second balance that we need to find. Socially, dad was responsible for four things regarding his son, okay? Number one, have the son circumcised to identify them with God's chosen people. That was one of his responsibilities as a dad. This is Old Testament. Now, number two, to pass on his inheritance to his firstborn son. And if you look at the Old Testament, you can see Esau dropped the ball on that one. Okay? And there's more, there's more examples of the fact that that didn't happen in that family. Now watch. Here's the third one. To find his son a wife. How many of you found a wife, selected a wife for your son. Anybody? You know, my, the Italians do this too. I, I remember my, my, uh, my mom telling me that my dad, uh, my, my grandmother, my nona, <laughs> tried to pick a wife for my dad, and she wasn't successful. <laughs> uh, it was my mom that was trying to pick a, a, a wife for me. And she wasn't successful either. So (laughs) I got the one I wanted. Anyway, number four is to teach him a trade. Dad had to treat his his son to support himself and his own family. 
Those were the four responsibilities, the primary ones that dads did back then. He was also responsible to lead his sons by example to make sure he took care of the disadvantaged around him, like widows, like the fatherless. Do you do that? Maybe, maybe you say, well, none of this stuff applies to me because I don't have any of my own kids. But you know kids. You're in a church with kids. What are you doing to lead them? What are you doing to teach them, right? James 1, 27 says this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows, the fatherless and widows, in their distress. That's the first one. And you might be real good at that, but the second part of this is a little tougher. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You get that? Oh, baby. You got to avoid the pollution part. I don't know about you, but when I was raising my kids, man, I, you know, when kids are little, I don't know, my, my, one of my kids was, was really compliant. And, and I thought, man, she's going to get out into the world, and man, it is going to eat her up. That was my daughter, obviously. And I didn't want the world to pollute her or my son, to influence them to the point where, where they were going to turn away from God You see, that first part, teaching our kids, training our kids to to care about people, to care about others, is something, if you look at the media, if you look at the world right now, that's something that's not being exemplified. It's not being trained, caring about others. Why? Because the second part of that, I believe, the pollution of the world comes in, and it affects us as fathers, us as men, Our Tuesday night Bible study, man, kingdom men. What a great Bible study teaching us to take responsibility as men uh, in raising our families, in being socially uh, cognizant of what's going on. All right? Keep oneself from being polluted by the world. My dad, my dad kept his opinions about people pretty much to himself around me. If I asked him what he thought of somebody that, that I knew that he knew, if he never made a disparaging remark about them or called them a name, he would say they were a potato. That's what he would say. Hey, Dad, what do you think of this guy? Oh, he's a potato. That's what he'd say. I wish I had taken on that custom that my father trained me to do instead of being polluted by the world that I am because I have opinions about people. Maybe, maybe you do as well. He's a potato. I don't remember my dad using uh, obscene language or swearing other than maybe a, a few what we call mild curse words. I don't remember that. Uh, I, uh, I remember that my dad didn't have anything. My dad didn't go to church with us. He prayed all the time. He didn't go to church with us. He had a major problem with people who professed to be Christians, especially men, because he worked with them. There's evidence. Talk to somebody in town. Talk to the mechanics in town. Talk to people here in town, just in your own mission field, and ask them their opinion of men. Because they will tell you, man, I know enough guys that will profess being Christians, and man, they go to church and they're real high profile, but man, you get them out of there and they cheat and they lie, and their, and their lifestyle does not match what they profess. God's saying, don't be polluted by the world. Be careful, because people watch us, boys watch us. What this world needs right now is men who will teach boys how to be men, how to be kind, how to be polite, how to be socially conscious of what the world and their mission field needs and applying themselves to that. I got one more, and it's economically. Yeah, how you doing with this balance thing? You guys, you guys okay? Maybe you're sitting there, you're okay. All right, I'm, I'm doing okay. 
Listen, I'm not here to make you feel good. <laughs> uh, we, if we're going to change this world, man, we got to start and we got to work harder. Economically, dad was to provide for the needs of the various members of his family. I'm looking at 1 Timothy 5.8. Watch this. But it, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those in his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Why? Because God's word tells us one thing and we do the opposite. That makes us worse than somebody who has never uh, learned that. We have to teach that. We have to train that. Amen? Boy, that's weak, man. You guys listening? Okay. Listen, this is how the Living Bible interprets that. Living Bible says, but anyone who won't care for his relatives when they need help, especially those living in his own family, has no right to say he's a Christian. Such a person is worse than a heathen. Now, I got to tell you something, because maybe I've known people who have carried that a little bit too far, and they become an enabler. And instead of teaching and training and nurturing, they seek to just make things easy for that individual. And that's not good either. God's word is specific about teaching us to, to, to cover our responsibilities. We need to do that more today than ever. It tells us, Scripture does, to find balance in our spending as well. 1 Timothy 6, I'm almost done. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, watch this. He says, Paul, this is Paul writing to Tim, by the way. He says in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Will we? Will you be content with food and clothing? Because a lot of times we're not. We, we take for granted the provisions that God makes for us and for our families. We don't recognize them. And listen, you know what this comes down to? This comes down to a lack of relationship with Christ. We have a lot of problems with that, okay? He goes on to say this. He says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation, you see this, and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of it. It's the priority of it. It's what we do with it. God wants us to be good investors, but he also wants us to care about others. He wants us to tithe to him just a portion of the blessings that he's given to us. And we even fail at that. I'm not begging you for money, by the way. Okay, that's not a... Uh, I'm just telling you, economically, a lot of times we're out of balance with this thing. We don't have any problem buying what we want. But we forget about all the things that we could be doing with that finance. And what God really deserves. How do we know? How do we know what God wants us to do with that money? You've got to pray, and you've got to, have a, you've got to have a relationship with Christ. Lord, what, if you're Lord of my life, he will tell you what he wants you to do with your finances. He will care for you. That's what he does. But see, we will come so close to, to, to making him Lord, but, but a lot of times it's the money part that we have an issue with, okay? All right, so they pierce themselves with many griefs. Look, finding balance in life is never, ever easy, especially in fatherhood, okay? We walk, listen, guys, we walk a razor's edge sometimes 
Because there are needs that we have as well. We need that time to spend fishing or, or getting away and just kind of gathering our thoughts, talking things over, planning. We need wisdom for this stuff. We need to have that balance. But the problem is, if you look at your life based on scriptures that we've read today, your life may be a little bit out of balance, leaning one way, maybe further away from the family, or maybe completely this way where you are to the point where you're so stressed that you're having a little bit of problems trying to keep it together. I've been in both areas. I've been in both of those. But I know what works. And this is where we find ourselves in Deuteronomy chapter 12. If you have your Bible still open. Deuteronomy 12 verse 28. This is not just for dads, by the way. The priorities have been set. We need balance and God has told us how to find it in those three categories. But this is what he says in Deuteronomy 12, 28. Be careful to obey all these regulations I am giving you so that it may go, uh, that may always go well with you and your children after you because you will be doing what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord your God. What a great statement. What a great promise that is. Because God says, you follow me, I'm not only going to bless you, but I'm going to bless the generations after you. Train these kids to love Jesus Christ. And I say train, don't just teach them, but live it yourself. Will you do that? You got to walk at razor's edge, man. You got to be careful on that tightrope. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for fathers. I thank you for the example that you've set for us. Lord, I thank you for the example that Jesus set for us as well, as a son, as an obedient son. I thank you, Lord, that you gave us this perfect example of one who not only was obedient to you, Lord, but also set the pace for every one of us. Every one of us in this life that would not look to religion to teach our kids, but would take relationship to teach our kids. Our relationship with you that would carry over into every generation after us. Lord, you know I pray for my grandkids every day. But Lord, I, I not only pray for them, you know, I not only pray that you will protect them and bless them with good health and watch over them and keep them from accident or injury. This is how I pray, Lord, you know that. But man, I pray too that you would help me in my testimony, in my walk, that my grandkids and my son and my daughter and, and, and the extended family and my mission field and everybody would see Jesus, Lord, in me. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I am totally sold out to you. Everything I have is all in. You are Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us to remember that. Help us to make you Lord. And I pray that our fatherhood, this balance, we would be able to find it as we go forward from here. Now we know. Now we know. Thank you, Lord, for that. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.